Hi there, and welcome to the podcast, Life as a, a show intently focused on exploring and unearthing the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. If you stop and think of where we're at as a dominant living organism, it really is quite mind blowing. In our existence, we have managed to proliferate and achieve some pretty fantastical feats relating to technology, medicine, sciences, and so on. And part of that has been our innate understanding that we are a species which builds off the back of one another. Our social togetherness and collaboration literally fuels much of our achievement. As such, we've found ways to ensure these key ingredients remain strong in order to allow for the constant flourishing of new ideas and innovation. Look no further than how we design our communities, cities, and countries. We have housing aimed at nurturing and providing for our social needs. Business hubs and districts allow for commerce and progress to be driven forward on a daily basis. All of this takes place through this never-ending global push for Kaizen, or continuous improvement. Nowadays, the tools we have to advance this agenda are tremendous. Think big data. Think institutions like MIT, where some of the brightest minds converge to help map out visions aimed at further advancing our species while attempting to offset or handle many of the challenges we collectively face. If all of this sounds as fascinating to you as it does to me, you're in luck. My guest today is one of the most astute and knowledgeable professionals out there when it comes to technology and urban planning. Sarah Williams is an Associate Professor of Technology and Urban Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, where she is also Director of the Civic Data Design Lab and the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism. Williams combines her training in computation and design to create communication strategies that expose urban policy issues to broad audiences and create civic change. She calls the process Data Action which is also the name of her recent book published by MIT Press. Williams is also the co-founder and developer of Envelope City, a web-based software product that visualizes and allows users to modify zoning in New York City. Before coming to MIT, Williams was co-director of the Spatial Information Design Lab at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation, GSAB. Her design work has been widely exhibited, including work in the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art, Venice Biennale, and the Cooper Hewitt Museum. Williams has won numerous awards, including being named one of the top 25 technology planners and game changers by Metropolis Magazine. Now, considering all of this, I'd like to say what an honor it is to have you on the program. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks so much. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean... Uh, to be honest, I've had this, you know, on my calendar for a while. I mean, there's so much that you do and there's so many questions that I have. And I think listeners are really going to enjoy this conversation. So yeah, why don't we get right into it? Um, yeah. The first segment I have here is something called Coloring Wikipedia. And basically, it's a segment where I just read off a definition of what the guest does. Um, now, I'd like to do it for a couple of reasons. One, it brings everyone up to speed on the actual, you know, job itself. And then two, I think it offers a nice jumping off point for the guests to kind of explore the definition. I mean, sometimes there's things that are within the definition that are underrepresented. Um, but other times, too, there's things that just, you know, I think we could explore further, or we could take further. But uh, unfortunately, I do have a bit of bad news. Uh, Wikipedia is letting us down somewhat here. Uh, it doesn't have a definition of a profession that encapsulates all that you do. So what I did is I created a bit of a workaround here. I have two definitions I'm going to go with. Uh, one is urban planning and one is big data. Um, I will say as well, I do fully acknowledge and understand that you are a professor. Um, I'm not going to throw that in there just because I think we're going <laughs> to, it would take a bit of time, I think, to, to unpack all of that. So let's focus on these other two. So. Without further ado, let me read off urban planning for you and then uh, big data and we can go from there. Sound good? All right, here we go. Urban planning. The responsibilities of an urban planner vary between jurisdictions and sometimes within jurisdictions. 
The following is therefore a general description of the responsibilities of an urban planner, of which an urban planner may well typically practice two or more of. An urban planner may also specialize in one responsibility only, land use planning, strategic urban planning, heritage and conservation, urban revitalization, master planning, transportation planning, economic development, environmental planning, urban design, infrastructure planning. Okay, big data, next definition. The term big data tends to refer to the use of predictive analytics, user behavior analytics, or certain other advanced data analytics methods that extract value from big data. All right, there it is, Sarah. Um, I know some of the definitions are a little bit basic here, but within the context of what you do at MIT, uh, what do these definitions mean to you? Well, um, one thing I was thinking is, well, you know, urban planning is such a broad field. So I, th I thought it was interesting how many things were listed there. Right. And then I think urban planners might list even more, but I think at the heart of what urban planners do is they're really translators between um, different fields, organizations. Um, I, I always like to call them, um, you know, kind of intermediary translators between two professions, right? You know, uh, for example, you know, if you're trying to develop criminal justice policy and apply it to urban development, um, planners help translate those ideas or they translate and communicate to communities um, the ideas of the government or, or they help translate the ideas of the community back up to the government, right? Um, mm -hmm. But you know, in order to do anything in the ur urban realm, it takes so many diverse and different stakeholders. And I think at the heart of what urban planning does is try to bring those stakeholders together in order to really improve our cities. Uh, but. Mm. Yeah, it's a really interesting take and one that I wasn't truthfully expecting, but it yeah, completely makes it. sense. No, no, it's really insightful. <laughs> and I really like that. Um, as far as big data, that big definition, data. that yeah. one was really quite simple, I think, but. Yeah, I mean, big data analytics is interesting because um, it's really defined by their current time right like what was big data to us today is very different from what big data was 10 years ago and yeah. it all has to do with what they call like the three these veracity velocity variety um, of information um, but big data encapsulates so many other things I think oftentimes people associate it with machine learning or augmented reality or the kinds of an analytics that we apply towards um, big data. I think in the context of what I do, I'm very much doing big data analytics, but I also do a lot of data ethics and ethics around using big data. And that's one of the things I teach at MIT. So, um, and that gets back to my translator role. I really try to translate the analytics of big data to communities, to society, to policy analysts. So that's where I feel like my planning intersection comes is I try to kind of take the insights that we can get um, from data analytics and use them to help society. Okay, so basically in essence, you're kind of like making sense out of what the numbers are telling people and putting it in simpler terms where people can you know, break it down for themselves to make those types of policy decisions or for government, so on and so forth. Yeah, exactly. And being the translator. <laughs> um, so if the data tells us, um, you know, I mean, I have a project where I use data to find vacant cities in China. Um, and we can then use that to create policy or analyze risk, but, um, you know, communicate that, how that, all of those numbers added up to that um, is important. Mm. No, it's absolutely fascinating. And I must, I must say as well, like I'd imagine, I have no idea, but I'm just guessing here that the rate of exponential change or the, the change within like big data, it must be exponential at this point. I mean, in the year on year where, you know, technology is allowing for the gathering of so much more. Is, is that, would that be accurate? 
Exactly accurate. Yeah. And then the algorithms are constantly developing right. and constantly changing, and um, which which just makes it so exciting. Uh, new programming languages coming out, new ways to visualize it, yeah. um, and. Um, new problems that come up. I remember I actually I started my profession as a geographer and I did a lot of analytics on satellite imagery. Um, and when I started, satellite imagery was considered big data and that was like a 15 meter by 15 meter pixel we had of the ground. And then we tried to estimate what was that is. Now we have a half a centimeter pixel. Um, and the problem is different, right? Because before we had to figure out, okay, it's taking a 15 meter by 15 meter mix reflectance, like that's urban and forest and yards. Like now we have like too many individual pixels showing us grass. <laughs> so how do we, we need different algorithms to deal with that. So um, it's, it's, it's fun. It's constantly changing. Yeah. 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 It keeps it fresh. I would imagine that's for sure. And new okay. problems and new ethical problems like you know bias in the data big data and and most of big data analysis when people think about it they think about twitter they think about facebook um they think about kind of all the data that advertising agencies and they're heavily biased information and so how to deal with all of this bias um is something that i'm interested in and the privacy aspects of it as well um, which all gets into my data ethics class how do we make sure that we do not use big data inappropriately or cause any harm with it is something yeah. that i try to advocate for with my students yeah yeah i had a similar discussion i had a guest on earlier in the year he's a gis analyst and we're you know, lightly talking about this topic. And I just found it absolutely compelling. I mean, the technology is advancing at such a rate, you know, whereas like the, the ethics and how do we manage this is just trying to keep up, at least it's what it seems like from the outside looking in. So I'd imagine there, there must be those moments in time where you're like, Ooh, this data, I don't know, it's, it's bordering or it's way over the line. You know, what are we going to do about it? You know, how do we inform the people that make the decisions on how to manage or how to manage this. I mean, that, that must be a bit of a challenge at times uh, to, to see that unfolding right between, you know, before your eyes. Um, yeah. In fact, like in my book, I have seven, seven principles of, of using data for action. And the last principle is creating your own ethical standards of practice because technology is, advances way further than we can create our ethics or create regulation bodies. So it's up to us to create those standards of practice and help promote them as we do our analytics. There it is. Excellent. <laughs> All right, I have one more question really quickly in this segment here. I mean, with yeah. all the different things I listed off that you're involved with right now, I mean, what normally I ask here, like, what is a typical day like for, for an individual, but maybe I should change this to a week or a month, perhaps? I mean, does even such a thing exist for you with so many things on the go? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, in a way, there are some things that are typical, right, that I um, teach in classes. Um, so those are kind of regular patterns, but we usually have multiple research projects going on um, in the lab. And so typically I'm either in class or working um, with each one of those research groups um, progressing that, that research. Um, and then there's work that I do for the university, you know, advocating for undergraduates or advising, but I would say a big portion of my time is working uh, with my research groups on the various projects. And so I usually create teams for each project that we have in the lab. Um, and one of the things that I really believe is important um, in data analytics for society is having really diverse teams. So they have people who specialize in a particular policy, uh, data analysts or data scientists, a data visualizer, um, uh, somebody who specializes in statistics, somebody who specializes in design. And so, uh, usually we have team meetings and then I'll have individual meetings as well. Okay. Well, I imagine we keep everything fresh in, in terms of that, you know, with, with so much going on, uh, you know, meeting with different types of individuals constantly, whether it be students or people within these teams, you know, you're constantly being exposed to different ideas and perspectives. And that must be a, a rewarding aspect to, to all that you do, I, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, being at MIT is 
like, I mean, I can't imagine being anywhere else. Like, I mean, the exciting research and people that you bump into every day is just incredible. And I mean, and my students who are absolutely brilliant um, and I enjoy working with them. Yeah. I mean, I loved teaching at Columbia, um, also amazing faculty, um, but I think, you know, because I do technology and urban planning, it just, when I came here, it just, you know, broadened all of the horizons. Um, yeah. And it allows yeah. you to think of new ways that you might apply your skills that you might not have mm. done before. Well, you're right on the edge. You're right on the edge of everything, I would say, probably at MIT, just with obviously like the name says it all essentially and right. And the, the talent, as you uh, just referenced, uh, that, that must be. Yeah, really I mean, exciting. but I'm, yeah, MIT also has this new college of computing, which is um, a recognition that computing should be interdisciplinary. Um, and so the, the whole school is based on kind of in, interdisciplinary education with computer science. And I'm super excited to be part of the core curriculum for that mm -hmm. uh, degree because I, you know, I teach a data visualization class, uh, which really communicates the outputs of uh, data, but we also use programming languages for it. So it's one of the core courses. And I just think it's so exciting to be an urban planner who's also teaching in a core course in computer science. And that's what I love about MIT is that kind of experimental nature. Let's hope it. Yeah. Let's hope it's a success. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really exciting. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense, obviously, to, to be marrying those sort of areas together in essence, right? I mean, it's, it's where things are going, and it, it seems kind of silly in a sense that it, it is like this most institutions at the moment. So, yeah, no, that sounds really think, uh, encouraging. You know, like at the heart of it, as educators, we should be training the next professionals, and they go out into the world and take as their core these skills so i mean you know i'm i'm really believe planners should be able to communicate with maps and data um and that it should just be a, a kind of a thing that that they know how to do just when you yeah. get out of school and you hire a player but the way that you get that in there is to train more planners so that when they get out into an urban planning department or consultancy they're kind of teaching up and bringing in those new skills and saying, okay, programming and technology can be part of advancing the field mm. of planning. Gotcha. Yeah, that's really interesting. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that, Sarah. Um, I do want to skip on over into a new segment, actually, a Q&A discovery. And the first question I have actually in this segment is one that often comes up with a lot of guests and for good reason. You know, I get a lot of comments, requests from listeners who want to know the backstory, you know, the origin, you know, of, of how these guests ended up, you know, where they're at right now. And maybe we could begin there with, with yourself. I mean, what took you to this point? Um, yeah, maybe you could share. Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, I started um, as a geographer. I was always interested in how like sp space played a role in society or like, what about your geographic location? Um, and I started, I did, um, a lot of remote sensing, satellite data also when I did that, but I was always really interested in design and interested in being a designer. So I was I was working as a computer programmer, you know, in a, a satellite imagery company, and then I I decided to go to architecture school <laughs> and like <laughs> totally like just a just little like, bit off. <laughs> it like it felt like it felt like I was veering off course, especially like you know architects make probably $40,000 a year or like a computer programmer makes a lot more. Um, often was questioning my uh, role in that, but um, then I went through architecture school and I, and when I came back, I worked um, as a landscape architect in the city of Philadelphia. And what I did is actually help them um, create green infrastructure. Um, and I did a lot of like prototypes of like green roofs on buildings and, uh, this is like very early days of this kind of work. And yeah. um, I realized like what I was actually doing was urban planning because I was like changing zoning codes and I was yeah. negotiating with these old uh, kind of city bureaucrats and like ch changing all kinds of things. And I just absolutely loved it um, and loved 
like that I felt like I could really have an impact on society and impact on civics and mm. it, just, it was really empowering. So I went to school to plannings uh, for planning and architect and planning are very uh, similar. I probably didn't yeah. have to go to planning school, but I think that's where I kind of mashed up my two skills, right? I had yeah. these significant data analytics skills and then I had now cultivated some serious design skills. And then I realized that not many people have those yeah. two things and that if I could mash them up, I could really help communicate some of the really important policy issues to society. So it's funny how like, as you're on the path, sometimes you're wondering like, what, what's, what am I Where's doing? Where's this going? <laughs> Where did, did, this am going? I on the right path? Yeah. <laughs> and now that I look back on it, I'm like, this makes so much sense, right? Yeah. Like that, um, you know, I really enjoyed architecture and the design field. And I really enjoy, enjoyed doing the data analysis. And I was able to create a career for myself by mashing those two things up. Yeah, it sounds like it. And almost maybe in, in a sense, perhaps even trailblazed an, a new path where others are going to follow even now that the I value is so. kind of being assigned to. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I hope I, so. But I mean, I think also my, you know, my parents are journalists and I had okay. always, I think in the heart of, of, I was really interested in civics and civics duty and like, how do we contribute to society? Like yeah. my, my parents did that through like journalism. I mean, I think that I wanted to be a journalist probably, but my parents were like, don't do that. It's a dying. <laughs> 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 um, so I found my kind of own journalist calling by doing these data visualizations, which I hope expose policy and issues in the same way kind of in a and so much of it is in a journalistic style yeah okay excellent well, i think that's probably a really nice segue into my next question here um your work at the civic design data lab you know first off is absolutely fascinating and in visiting the website researching for this talk of course um i came across like the chief principle of what this organization stands for and believes in and it's very very clear from the website and i just want to read this off for listeners right now um it says, big data will not change the world unless it is collected and synthesized into tools that have a public benefit. Now, before I ask for comments from you, I'd like to read off a few article headlines from this website as well. One is called Ghost Cities, another is Digital Matadus, and another is Central American Migration. So within the context of what we've just maybe speaking about and also what Civic Design Data Lab stands for, maybe you could further elucidate, you know, what the organization is all about. Yeah, I mean, so at the heart of what we try to do um, at the Civic Data Design Lab is really um, use data and data analytics to create policy change um, and um, or civic change and and one of the main ways that we do that is through communicating complex data analytics, but really exposing policy issues in, um, in new ways and new dimensions so that people are able to understand and, and interpret them. Um, you know, I, as I, like many of the projects in the lab have that at focus, and I think through the work um, I really come up with this idea of calling it data action, which is what my book is called. And it's, a, I think, a methodology that I hope others can follow when they want to also use data for a public good. And I think really it starts with these teams, building teams uh, to work with data. So if you're going to answer complex problems in the urban environment, um, build teams to do that. So let's like take the digital Matatus headline that you uh, ran off that, that project. Um, what it did is actually map the informal transit system in Nairobi, Kenya, and believe it or not, like it's the main form of public transport, but there was no maps or data about where it went. Um, and we started with a team of computer scientists from the University of Nairobi, policy experts in transportation, a political scientist, um, myself, and uh, we, you know, collected the data using an app that we developed, um, but then also made 
a map, a physical map of that. Um, it's the it was the first informal transit system searchable in Google. Um, but I think like what was important about that project is that by building teams, we were able to create a greater impact. The government, we involved them and then they trusted the data. Um, we had local transport com community who held hackathons to teach the local technology community how to use the, the data set. And now there's five uh, apps that like uh, very popular apps in Nairobi that use that data as the back end. Um, we, you know, our political scientist was able to connect it to people doing resource on transport and now the data has been used to do analytics. So not just, you know, doing that one off analytic, but really part of what our projects do is trying to kind of get it out there in the field and kind of think about all the multiple ways that you can use it for change. But Data for Action is about building these teams, is about collecting original, unique data. It's about quantifying it uniquely. It's about ground truthing it, and then really visualizing it and opening up for anyone to see through these data visualization. And then kind of creating a loop or an edit project where we can you know, make sure we edit the analysis that we work on. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. You're, you're essentially changing ecosystems, really, right? I mean, you're touching on so many different points there, like infrastructure, you know, social aspects as well. I mean, this impacts people's lives, of course, and and how they how they live. Uh, that, that must be really well. One, as I said, you know, fascinating, I mean, but the really, digital matatsus was uh, so great because we, they actually printed the map in the newspaper, um, but. The majority of cities in the world have this kind of informal transit system. So after we did Nairobi, we really inspired cities all over the world. And we now have 40 different cities from Amman to Managua to we just did Dominican Republic. Um, but the idea is not for us to do it, but for uh, yeah. what we try to do is have people teach each other and just make those connections. So yeah. that Empower you know, the people within those countries or cities themselves to, to be able to leverage it and use it in the best way possible, right? Yep. Wow. That's a really, yeah, really, really interesting. And I think it perfectly sort of encapsulates everything, you know, what Civic Design Data Lab would seemingly be all about. Yeah, I mean, and I think part of what Data for Action, the book, you know, which represents kind of the methodology we created in the lab, what we're trying to do is provide a guide for people who do want to use data for a public good. I mean, I work with so many data analysts that are interested in using data towards the betterment of society. And how can we do that like ethically and responsibly? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think, I, I hope the, the methodology that we lay out in the book um, creates a way for people to do that. But I, you know, through this building teams, collecting data and Genuously and but ground truthing and asking people in the data set whether it rings true to them, um, some of the analytics. And this goes back to, you know, many urban planners are very uh, worrisome of data uh, because of the ways that have been really used inappropriately in the past. And so just being an urban planner that's interested in data, not so much anymore, but was an oddity because of some of the really problematic ways that we use data to marginalize populations and the homeowners mm. loan insurance map are, are a great example of that. And so one of the things that I try to do in the book is say, yes, actually you can do a lot of harm and pay attention, but these are the ways that you can think about it ethically yeah. and responsibly.